Good evening and welcome to the University of Chicago, Francis and Rose Yuen campus in Hong Kong for the fourth program of our new fall Yuen lecture series titled U.S. Presidential Election. My name is Mark Barnico and I'm the Executive Director of the University of Chicago, Francis and Rose Yuen campus in Hong Kong, the university's premier location in Asia, representing our values of free and open discourse, rigorous debate, and the exchange of ideas. We're streaming tonight's event live via Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube. And I'd like to remind audience members, you can submit questions through the questions and answer tab by first registering on Zoom. For news and information on the latest UN campus events, please check out our website at www.uchicago.hk or follow the UChicago UN campus Facebook page. We hope this series has helped to facilitate a conversation about US democracy, provided insight into circumstances around voting in the upcoming election, and shared a useful framework for understanding the challenges we're facing between the US and China. Tonight, less than a week from the election in the United States, Professor William Howell will discuss his new book, Presidents, Populism, and the Crisis of Democracy, and take your questions. Tonight, Professor Howell will share his unique perspective on US presidential powers as nationalistic and populist sentiments have been on the rise in nations around the world. William Howell is the Sidney Stein Professor in American Politics at the University of Chicago, where he holds appointments in the Harris School, the Political Science Department, and the college. Currently, he's the Chair of the Political Science Department director of the Center of Effective Government, and co-host of the podcast, Not Another Politics Podcast. Professor Hall is a leading scholar on the powers of the United States presidency. He's written widely on separation of powers issues and American political institutions, especially the presidency, and is currently working on research projects on separation of powers, the origins of political authority, and the normative foundation of executive power. He's also authored and co-authored many books and textbooks on the American presidency and American politics, and his research has appeared in numerous professional journals, major publications, and edited volumes. William is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a former fellow at the Center of Advanced Studies in Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. He's the recipient, among other academic awards, of the Legacy Award for Enduring Research on Executive Politics, the William Riker Award for the Best Book in Political Economy, the D.B. Hardman Prize for the Best Book on Congress, the Richard Neustadt Award for the Best Book on the American Presidency, and the E.E. E. Schatzneider Award for the Best Dissertation in American Politics. His research has been supported by the National Science Foundation, the Smith Richardson Foundation, the Democracy Fund, and the Bradley Foundation. We're delighted to have Professor Hall join us once again this evening. William, I'll turn the floor over to you to get us started and join you again for the Q&A. Terrific. Thanks so much, Mark. What a pleasure to be back with you and uh, ahead of this really monumental election that stands before us um, and to take some time to try to take stock of, well, um, not just what the next few days look like, but what we're amidst, what, what, what this political moment sort of presents to us and how we might pave a way forward. Um, there is here, I'm, I should say, I'm here in my storage closet. Um, it's uh, I, I, what I'm giving up in terms of beauty. I am securing. I'm 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 taking back in terms of security. Uh, I have two children who are uh, doing remote learning, um, and they're going to be arising early. It's it's morning time here in Chicago. Um, they're going to be arising, and there's going to be all sorts of disruption out there shortly. But we're safe in here, and I'm just pleased to be able to have some time to talk to you. So, okay, so. Oh, the election, the election is coming up. I mean, the election is underway. It, tens of millions of people have already voted, um, but election day as stipulated in the constitution is the first Tuesday in November. Um, that is just a handful of days away. Um, and 
And while votes may well be, they will be in many states counted after election day, the final votes to actually be cast will be on Tuesday. And in these moments every four years, I think we're accustomed to doing two things um, as we try to make sense of this moment. One is to look sort of impulsively every 15 minutes at what the latest polls have to say. And when we do that here in the United States, the attention is paid not just to what the national polls look like, but what the polls look like in key states, key competitive states, because of the Electoral College, which is something that, you know, when I joined you uh, a few weeks ago, we talked about um, the Electoral College dictates that some, frankly, some states are going to count more than others. Um, and, uh, and how they turn is going to have um, big implications for who eventually wins. So there's this impulsive need and um, uh, and interest in, you know, trying to figure out what's going to happen uh, by looking at what the latest polls have to say. Just as there's a, a lot of attention paid to the latest campaign events, the latest things that are said, right, the latest accusations that are levied, either by the incumbent president or the challenger or their surrogates. And there's sort of a flurry of activity on this front as well. And I'm hoping that we can take our time for the next hour or so to frankly do neither of those two things. Um, the first is unsatisfactory in that we're gonna know shortly how the votes are actually cats, right? We don't need to spend a whole lot of time trying to guess that which is right around the corner. Um, we're gonna know soon enough. Um, and on the latter, there's been a lot of work done by political scientists that try to make sense of um, the relevance of campaigns and the things that are said for the event eventual electoral outcomes. And in the main, they don't show big effects. It's not to say that campaigns don't matter. It's not to say that October surprises or particular gaffes or scandals have no bearing. But really, uh, if you want to sort of have a understanding of the way that American politics works and how elections break, it's worth paying attention to fundamentals. And so I'm hoping that we can, in this hour ourselves, pay attention to fundamentals and take stock of, of what's happening. And a big part of what's happening, and it's in the title of this book that I wrote with Terry Moe. Terry is a, an old friend and colleague of mine. He, he teaches at Stanford University and is a fellow also at the Hoover Institution. Um, uh, in the title is this notion of a crisis of democracy, which stands before us and which we're trying to make sense of where it comes from um, and what we might be able to do about it. And the evidence of this crisis, well, the evidence abounds. Um, let me briefly point to a number of things that I think we ought to recognize. It's the health or the lack thereof of a free and independent press. You see that as local news media outlets um, struggle to survive just as uh, social media um, proliferates and cable news and uh, um, takes hold and is increasingly riven with partisan divisions. You see this with the drain of talent in the administrative state. Those with expertise and their willingness to serve um, and those who are already serving but their willingness to continue to make costly investments in expertise all of that is under assault. Um, and you, we've seen increasingly an administrative state of bureaucracy that is hollowed out. Shockingly low levels of public trust in public uh, institutions. This is something which we've seen over time um, when, you, when we tra track the levels of support for Congress or for the presidency or, or belief in democracy. Um, we've seen steady declines and they're now frankly at shockingly low levels uh, of, of support and trust that are being registered by the American public, particularly when they look at Congress, that depending upon the polls, the trust that Congress will be able to meet the challenges that stand before us lingers somewhere between the high single digits and the low teens. Um, the assault that we're seeing daily on basic democratic norms, norms not just of civility, but norms about the legitimacy of uh, political um, opposition, the legitimacy of the adjoining branches of government. Um, there's just been a, an ongoing assault on democratic norms. And, and then, and moreover, the degradation of public discourse. Um, our ability as a country to come together and to grapple with 
the challenges that stand before us and to recognize that in important ways we're in this together has been profoundly compromised. Um, we are as divided um, as we've been in a long time. And so therein lie some of the evidence of a crisis of democracy. And I think a thing that what we need to do when we think about this upcoming election is to recognize the stakes of this election don't just have to do with whether or not one policy or another policy is adopted, right? It's not just about whether or not we're going to break left on the ideological spectrum or break right as a function of whether or not Joe Biden wins the presidency or uh, Donald Trump does so. Um, in important ways, there's a broad sense that, that our democracy itself is on the ballot um, and deep concern that um, we, as a country, sort of the future of our country and, our, be able to, and our, our, our ability to kind of grapple with our disagreements and divisions um, is, 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 is going to be, is going to be, is, is on the ballot again. Okay, so that's true, that's true, but it overstates matters. Um, because frankly, the trend lines that lead us to this moment go back, frankly, decades and they're likely to persist for a good deal of time. And what I'd like to do in the you know, 20 minutes that I'm gonna be speaking is give you a sense of what I think is behind this crisis of democracy, what we lay out in the book, um, what, uh, where this crisis comes from and what needs to be done to combat it. Um, and the place to start is to recognize the force of populism in contemporary American politics. Um, and to recognize that Trump, who stands, I think according to many, would recognize Trump as standing at the center of this assault on democracy or presenting these challenges to democracy. The thing to understand about Trump is that Trump is a populist and that Trump is channeling populism and um, leveraging populism for his own political gain. Um, so how does this play out? Well, we see this in his rhetoric. We see this in his disregard for the truth. We see this in his, in his impatient for democratic processes and his contempt for institutional procedures. We see it in his unending demand for loyalty, in his affinity and indeed his expressed admiration for strong men around the globe. That in many ways, I think when we think about the assault on democracy, certainly critics of Trump point towards Trump as the culprit. Um, but it would be a mistake to, in trying to make sense of this, to linger too long on the particulars of Trump's biography or his character, to say, well, this is about Trump and his inexperience or his habits of mind and ignorance or his penchant for tweeting or his troubled relationship with his father or the fact that he's been thrice married. I mean, that's not where the action is, right? If you wanna make sense of what's happening, what we need to do is to recognize that what Trump is doing is, that Trump is a populist and the significance of this presidency is not the man who occupies the office, but rather the populism that he channels and the populist rules that constitutes his political play, uh, playbook. So what do we mean by populism? Like, what, what are we talking about? We, we're concerned about the state of our democracy and we think that Trump is a populist, then what, what, what do we mean? So it's worth remembering that populism is not synonymous with a commitment to the people. Uh, the, the definition that we employ in our book um, and that uh, is commonplace among scholars, but is not the kind of... Uh, it's, it's not what's, how it's usually referred to in the popular press. Um, and it, it, the thing, way to think about populism, it's not a willingness to speak up for the little guy and to defend his rights. Rather, it expresses itself through rhetoric and through motive. And let me just say a little bit about each. So what the populist does when he steps forward, and it's usually a he, not exclusively, but it's usually a he, what the populist does is offers an unsparing, an undifferentiated critique of a political order, right? It's speaking wholesale language about a, a political regime that is broken and is rotten and is rigged and is illegitimate. 
experts and the establishment and the swamp are all indicted wholesale. And what the populace does, right, as the outsider is presents himself as standing outside of this wreckage and then calls upon us to lend our hopes and aspirations to invest in him, to pledge our allegiance in him because he will deliver that which this discredited political regime will not. Right? And he will do so on behalf of the people. In the United States, the people means um, typically what certainly Trump has in mind are primarily white, um, Christian, um, conservatives. That's who the people are, the true Americans. But what you'll see here is that in this rhetoric, again, it's, it is by taking, assuming this posture that offers an undifferentiated critique of the political order, that then what the populace is doing is leaving very little room for constructive action, right? The move is not to simply step in and to say, um, you know, things are broken, people are not being adequately served, and what we need to do is to roll up our sleeves and set to work on fixing things. Well, we need to, we need to replace one set of institutions with a new set of institutions, one set of policies with a new set of policies. That's not it, right? The rhetoric that's employed leaves little room for constructive action. And that's because the second piece of what it means to be a populist, again, has to do with the motive. The critique is not meant to lay the groundwork for positive action. Rather, the critique is meant to sow outrage and disaffection and anger. The critique, is, the, the critique through and through is meant to delegitimize and to marginalize and to clear a space into which the populace can step unhindered and unencumbered, right? That's what's going on here. So, so we have, then, and, and you can see then through this why populism represents a threat to democracy because the political order that's being critiqued, the political regime that's being critiqued is a democratic regime. Right? It's a it's democracy itself. And what the populist is doing is by separating himself, distinguishing himself from that political order and saying, vest your hopes and aspirations in me in the service of not problem solving, but continuing to sow anger, disaffection and outrage. Right. That what we have then is um, the stuff of demagoguery. What we have then is the stuff of personal rule. We don't have the stuff of small d democratic um, commitments and norms and procedures, which are messy uh, and uh, contested. Um, and so in this way, when we think about what's behind a crisis of democracy, I think we have to recognize in recognizing what populism is, that it presents a profound threat to the health of a democracy. So where does it come from? Like, why, why has populism taken hold in this country, in the United States? Um, and here again, it's worth recognizing a couple of things to, to, I mean, to answer this. It's first is to recognize that populism thrives amidst political dysfunction. It serves as its primary justification, in fact. It's not just discredited party, but discredited regimes, right? It's not just about the failures of one agency or another. It's about a swamp that is, that is utterly failed. It's amidst scandal and corruption and demonstrable and sustained and pervasive inability to attend to the welfare of citizens that the claims of populace, the rhetoric of populace resonate. They take hold. Right? There are, these are the moments in which populism thrives. It's when institutions in important ways have failed. And, and that serves as its primary justification for its emergence. But just as populists exploit dysfunction for their own political gain, so too do they propagate dysfunction. Populists stand in perpetual opposition. Their posture is one continually 
of defiance. They sneer at existing norms and institutions. They thrive amidst disruption. They deploy whatever power is within their reach, not in the service of responsible governance or progressive democratic expansion or lifting up the voices of those who have been ignored and setting to work on attending to their needs in a systematic, comprehensive, responsible, deliberative way. Rather, uh, what they do is they sow their outrage. They point to again and again, the failures of government as continual justification for not just their rise to power, but the reason why they should continue to hold on to power. So for populists, effective government problem solving isn't the ticket to political immortality, demagoguery is. And so what you then see is that here within the United States, and this isn't something that we lay out in considerable detail in the book, the failure of our government to attend to the long-standing challenges of modernity, challenges associated with immigration, globalization, automation, the deep structural changes to our economy and the harm felt by that the, by, the, is felt by individual communities and the anxieties that they unleash. The failure of government for decades to attend to these problems laid the groundwork, served as kind of the prerequisites for Trump's rise to power, Trump as populist to take hold in our American politics and for the rise of populism more generally and for the crisis of democracy that we now confront. So there it is. If what you wanna do is take stock of the crisis of democracy, you need to recognize what populism is. You need to recognize where populism comes from and where populism comes from. Again, this is a story, not just of the United States. This is a story that we see in Latin America, wherein in the aftermath of widespread corruption scandals, you see populist rhetoric taking hold and populist fortunes uh, rising. You see this in uh, Europe, wherein failures of government to attend to the challenges of mass immigration have unleashed all kinds of doubt and anxiety and anger that then populists use for their own political purposes. And so too within the United States, that it's in the aftermath of sustained failure of our government, that there is in fact a deep critique and it's a deep critique that we need to take seriously um, uh, that populism offers, uh, it's a false promise that populism delivers. Because again, right, what the populist does is it offers a deep critique, but doesn't deliver on a solution. But when we take stock of where populism comes from, we then need to recognize that there are institutional failures. There are things that our government has failed to do that um, unless it, 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 it finds a way to productively move forward on, the fortunes of populism will persist. And that even if Trump then loses office come Tuesday or come a week from Tuesday, as we continue to count votes, it's not altogether clear exactly when we're going to, uh, we're going to know the outcome of this election. But that even then the, the, the groundwork for populism uh, and the opportunity for future populism to rise to powers are going to be in place. So there, so sure, there's a lot at stake with this election, but there's a lot at stake too for what follows. And what follows if what we wanna do is combat populism and kind of resurrect our democracy and put it on a sounder footing is to pay attention to uh, and to recognize and to take ownership of the failures of government and the need to build institutions that are more effective at solving problems. So this is a big part of then what our book does, is it tries to having recognized the threat that populism presents and identifies where populism comes from, we try to then identify a set of institutional reforms that are needed to solve problems in order to combat populism and in order to undertake the work, the progressive work of resuscitating our democracy. Um, and so let me say a little bit about this and kind of characterize where our thinking is on this front. Um, because it, it's not, it's, it's a nuanced story. It's a nuanced story because 
on the one hand, amidst populism, right? And amidst a time when populism now has taken hold of the White House, your first instinct, if what you want to do is to combat it, is to sort of shut down the presidency and to celebrate every impediment to presidential power and to um, uh, look for every opportunity we can to kind of tie the presidency up in knots and to protect us from the demagoguery, from the threats that presidential power presents in this era of rising populism. And there's certainly something to that. There are real reasons to fear presidential power. That's for sure true. But it's not so straightforward. It's not that if, if all we do is right, um, shut down the presidency, that then we're going to kind of be in the clear. Um, it's not so clear because that is to ignore, again, the very reason why Trump was able to rise to power. Remember the critiques that he offered in 2016, and then he continues to offer now, right? It's about the system is rigged. The system is broken. And, and how do you know that? It's because immigration is an utter catastrophe and our trade deals of sold out Americans and our healthcare system is broken through and through, right? So if what you want to do is to push back against that kind of critique, you need to be able to point to an ability of the government to actually solve problems, to actually do things that majorities and supermajorities recognize as the legitimate subject of government action. You need to get into the business of building a more effective government. And here, the presidency as an office plays a vital role. The, we, there are reasons why we need an independent presidency um, in order to solve problems. The presidents offer a kind of leadership that runs in scarce supply in our national politics. And it's a leadership that pays more attention to national concerns it's a leadership that pays more attention to the long-term implications of policy change than the kind of representation that we're accustomed to observing within Congress. That Congress, as a, a, a deliberative body, is a bastion of special interest politics and parochialism and uh, short-term thinking. By design, when you have a... a the first branch of government that's divided into two chambers and that people have to seek re-election every two or six years by currying the support of organized interests within their districts or their states. And then you then you know, turn to 535 voting members across two chambers to sort through the profound challenges that we as a country face. There, there, are, there are, again, by institutional design, reasons to temper our uh, expectations that we're going to meet the challenges of globalization or climate change or the structural changes to our economy or rising inequality between the rich and the poor and on and on. If we're gonna make headway on those kinds of things, we need presidential leadership, right? There is a promise to presidential leadership that we need to find ways to responsibly leverage. And so then the challenge that is put before us when we think about the threat of populism is to recognize at once the fear and the promise of presidential leadership and to, and to reconstitute the presidency for modern times in the service of a more effective government. And the way you do that is not by saying, well, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, right? It's not just about saying, well, not too hot, not too cold. Plain vanilla moderation is the way to go. That's, that's not the way to go. Rather, what we need is a two-pronged test for, for the kinds of institutional reforms that we need to undertake to rebuild our democracy uh, and to put our democracy on our sounder footing. The two-pronged test is that on the one hand, we need to recognize the fear. And when we rethink the kinds of powers that ought to be given, ought to be extended, ought to be taken away, it's with an eye towards what kind of behavior a demagogue, a populist demagogue might uh, undertake and how they might use those powers, not in the service of national interests or long-term um, 
the long-term interests of the country as a whole, but how they might do so in order to shore up support within their base, in order to advance their own personal political fortunes, these kinds of things. So there's the fear that we need to take seriously, but then the promise, will an endowment of authority be in the service of advancing national long-term interests? That's the key question. Um, and so therein lies our two-pronged test, paying attention to both the fear and the promise. So what would that then look like? So the last chapter of the book, let me just say a little bit about this before we open it up. Um, the last part of the book kind of walks through a set of institutional reforms that Terry and I think would be in the service of a more effective government um, and therefore constitute uh, a the most kind of responsible pushback um, that we can imagine to the threat of populism um, and therefore in the service of attending to the crisis of democracy that stands before us. Let me give you a flavor of what these are. So we've got three big reforms. Um, the first is uh, an enhancement of presidential power. And it has to do with expanding the president's agenda setting authority. So the under the US Constitution, presidents don't have the ability to propose legislation within Congress, not propose it formally. They can do so informally, of course. They can use the bully pulpit in order to articulate what their policy agenda is and hope that some legislator will pick it up and introduce bills and um, build the coalitions needed within Congress in order to pass them. But the president cannot formally command the vote. And to our mind, that's a power that ought to be given to the president. It's a power that we observe within parliamentary regimes. It's a power that we think would decidedly be, be in the service of advancing long-term national interests, uh, the kinds of long-term national interests that presidents channel, uh, but it's also a power that um, in the hands of a demagogue would not constitute uh, a profound threat because again, Congress is free to amend, excuse me, not to amend, but to overturn anything the president introduces. So under our proposal, what the president could do is to say, here, here's a bill. This is what I'd like to see. This is how I would like to attend to the problem associated with immigration, healthcare, climate change, on and on. And Congress would be forced to vote. And they would be forced to vote within a certain period of time and to vote on an up or down basis. So it's not an opportunity for Congress to step in and to water down these bills and to make them kind of okay for organized interests back home, to uh, sort of lard them up with all kinds of carve outs and exceptions so that they're acceptable to either party or industries. They have to cast a vote on the president's terms, um, but they're free to vote it down. If they don't vote though, it'll automatically become law. And so this to our mind would enliven the legislative process, which right now is broken. It would, um, it would enhance the representation of national long-term interests. And it would do so in ways that are at once responsible and that build off of the kind of experience that we have in trade policy, wherein presidents actually have something called fast track authority. They've had it for decades um, that has successfully in the main tempered the influence of organized interests, um, led to the liberalization of US trade policy around the globe, um, and in the main attended to uh, the kinds of national long-term concerns that presidents stand to channel. Okay, so that's an enhancement. Most everything else though that we kind of counsel that we offer when it comes to institutional reform has to do with either reducing or eliminating other kinds of presidential powers that presidents currently have. We call for the greater insulation of intelligence agencies and the Department of Justice. This is a big one that there's all kinds of authority that the Department of Justice in particular wields in protecting the rule of law in prosecuting those within government who are behaving in ways that are anti-democratic and or illegal. And when you have a president who can leverage the extraordinary power of the Department of Justice in the service of protecting his friends, protecting himself, 
or prosecuting his enemies, this constitutes a viable, uh, uh, excuse me, a, 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 an acute threat to our democracy. So, you know, on the promise and fear thing, right, we should be seeing the, you know, blinkered lights going off on the fear side here. And it's not altogether clear that, um, you know, the enhanced opportunities for presidents to meddle in the Department of justice serve the goals of effective government at all, which is what the promise of effective presidential leadership is. So this is a space in which we want to dramatically reduce the kinds of influence the presidents wield, just as we want to curtail the number of political appointees that presidents can make to the administrative state. So in the United States, presidents can make thousands of political appointments um, that give them the opportunity to put in uh, their loyalists and lackeys to run agencies that um, social scientists have shown. When you load up an agency with a bunch of political appointees, what you have, what that has the effect of do is, doing is displacing the kinds of expertise that they, um, that they have. They, they don't run as well. They don't know as much. They don't perform to the kind of higher levels of standards. Uh, by virtue of the increased numbers of political appointments that are made. And so Terry and I want, so you see an immediate trade-off here between the exercise of this power and good government, just as you see, and we see this under Trump, this particular power being used to blatant, uh, uh, blatantly political ends. And so in the hands of a populist, the ability to politicize the administrative state generally um, is profoundly problematic. There are other powers too, like the pardon power, uh, concerns about conflicts of interest, unilateral powers that we see reason to either altogether eliminate or curtail. Um, and there we can talk about this in the question and answer period. But the work that lies ahead for us is profound because what we need to do, if what we wanna do is push, push back against populism, is roll up our sleeves and to figure out how we can reconstitute these institutions so that we can build a more effective government than the one that we currently have, so that we are on more sounder footing. And so the concern that I have is that come, I don't know exactly when it will be, maybe it will be Tuesday night, but it will only be Tuesday night if it's a blowout. There's a good chance it'll be in the days that follow. We will know the outcome of this election if Joe Biden and Kamala Harris win, that there will be this collective sigh of relief on the part of Democrats. And they'll say, oh, we dodged one there, right? At last, the long national nightmare of, you know, uh, Trumpism is, is at an end. Um, and now we can set to work on shifting a set of conservative policies and making them liberal, making a bunch of appointments to the judiciary that are more to our political liking, and then we'll be in the clear. That would be a gross misdiagnosis of the lessons that we need to be learning from where populism came from, how Trump rose to power, the threat to our democracy that, that is underway and that is going to persist. Because unless we build a set of institutions that can solve problems again, the concern is not just that, well, Trump will rise again, but somebody else will channel the populism that he successfully channeled in order to rise to power. And it may well be somebody who is more disciplined, who is more focused, who doesn't have the personal liabilities um, uh, that Trump has that will set to work on undoing our, undoing our democracy in, in the years ahead that, that, that is, is cause for profound, profound concern. So lots of work lies ahead. The stakes of this election clearly are huge and we can talk about about them um but uh if you're rooting for american democracy all all your work lies ahead of you regardless of the outcome um because it's not just about who occupies the office it's about the need for deep institutional reform in the service of a more effective government if what we're going to do is resuscitate our democracy that's the kind of core argument of our book that's the kind of moment that we inhabit as we see it um, I welcome your questions, your thoughts, your feedback, your pushback. And so Mark, if you'd like to um, uh, join the conversation, we can have some exchange.
Great, thank you, Professor Hall. Um, I found this to be a really fascinating book and so rich in the history and the um, recommendations that you, you and Terry came up with um, uh, toward the end of the book. The question that um, strikes me is where do political scientists with these ideas go to um, get, get the ideas implemented? What, what, is, what is a path? Um, and what, and the second part of that question is, where would you recommend that we start if, you know, rather than boiling the ocean, if we took one small step toward uh, changing the way we do things, what would you recommend that we start with? So these are great questions. How do we productively move forward? I mean, even if you, if you grant that, look, the problems are our institutions and we need to reconstitute them, um, what would it mean to productively move forward? To my mind here, um, the, 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 the best example of sustained movement in the service of uh, more, a more effective government is the progressive era of the late 19th century and early 20th century. And it's a movement that played out over decades in which political observers recognized that they had inherited a constitutional structure that was ill-suited to meet the challenges of their day, industrialization, the emergence of the United States on the world stage, immigration then as well. Um, and there were journalists and business uh, uh, men and women and academics and, um, and politicians who then honed their attention on the failures of government and set to work on building like the civil service reform in reconstituting the powers that presidents have in important ways in building a modern state and this is work that takes years this is not the this is not the kind of thing that you can simply do in the first hundred days of a new presidency it takes years it may take decades um, but a big part of it is doing frankly what we're doing right now is to carve out a space in our politics where these conversations can happen, where an ideas can be generated and where political pressure then is put on political actors to set to work on rebuilding the institutions that they inhabit. That we need to be in a place wherein it's not okay that the president wield the kinds of powers that he, that, that he wields without some sort of political pushback, um, without legislators holding hearings and investigations, introducing new bills to, to offer corrections. There are lots of kind of roads to reform through the legislative process, through, the, through a constitutional amendment, through unilateral actions that presidents can take. Um, and there will be some, I mean, in Biden in his most recent, um, you know, in the most recent debate has come out and said, you know, he's going to convene a set of experts to think about judicial reform so good, we should do that, which will offer a set of formal recommendations. That's, and then the question is when they do so, how can we put kind of those recommendations into motion in the service of actual change? You see all kinds of organized interests coming forward and saying, Here's, here are the reforms that we, knew we now need, blue ribbon commissions coming forward. In our own small way, this book is an effort to kind of generate this kind of conversation so that we can at once recognize what we're up against and then think creatively and anew about how we reconstitute our institutions in the service of meaningful change. It's about talk, it's about pressure, it's about organization. Um, uh, it's about sort of the base elements of what political change looks like. And we need to set to work in undertaking it and not just sort of think, well, our institutions are fixed evermore. Um, and, uh, and to the extent that we set to work on um, uh, reforming them, it's in the service of preservation. It's in the service of reform, returning to that original constitutional moment and channeling the interests and hopes and aspirations of our founders rather than thinking an, anew for ourselves and recognizing that that which we're up against exceeds the wildest, wildest imaginations of, of, of our founders and that we have an obligation ourselves to not just inherit and preserve, but to reconstitute and remake the institutions that, um, that 
uh, that, that constitute our politics. So we clearly have a lot of work ahead of us. And um, I guess what I take away from uh, your response is just how hard democracy is. Mm -hmm. um, and that we just have to keep working on it. Um, in very much the University of Chicago way, I'd like to um, throw out a couple of questions from one of our audience members who uh, doesn't agree with some things that right. you said. And, uh, and at U Chicago, we don't live in a bubble. Um, we like to hear dissenting opinions. Um, this particular audience member said, I don't see anything wrong with being a populist. And I disagree on the stance that Trump sees people as mostly white conservatives. How do you respond to people that that asks uh, questions like that? What, what would you say to them to bring them along? Well, first of all, I welcome the dissent. I mean, I think that part of the, when I say we need to carve out a space to have a conversation, it is a conversation in which we need to argue with one another um, and to try to make sense of what we're up against. A couple of things. Um, the reason why it's important to define populism up front is because I think there are different, people have different notions about what it constitutes. Um, and if what your view is, is that populism is simply an opening up of the franchise and the inclusion of voices that weren't previously heard um, and uh, a vestment of authority and opportunity in people who have been excluded from our politics, if that's what you think of when you think of populism, then I would say, great. Um, and that is a good thing, right? Those forces are decidedly to the good for our democracy, but I don't want to have an argument over words. What I mean by populism and what scholars mean by populism is something very different. It's something much more nefarious. Um, it has sort of uh, elements of those kinds of claims, but it quickly, it, it quickly veers into claims to personal power. I alone can fix it. I'm going to delegitimize other political actors, be they my opponents or other individuals who have authority unto themselves. Anybody who stands in my way um, is meant to be marginalized. That that are those are constituent features of populism as I and most scholars define it, and it's profoundly problematic for the health of a democracy. Um, when a thing that populists do is they often talk about reclaiming. America for Americans, reclaiming Germany for Germans. Um, and a thing that distinguishes left-wing from right-wing populism is that who they have in mind when they talk about uh, the individuals who embody true, for our, in our instance, true Americans. And I think it's um, while, um, Trump has you know, made a habit of saying he's done more for black Americans than anybody save Lincoln and maybe not even Lincoln. This is sort of a standard line that he's been using over the months. I don't think um, you know, the, the populism that he's channeled, if you look at the rallies that he goes to, when you think about who constitutes his base, the imagery that he evokes, it's really about Christian conservatives uh, white conservatives who constitute his base, who he is, um, uh, when he's talking about saving, you know, um, uh, America for Americans, that's really who he has in mind. Um, that's who he's set to work on behalf of, it's who he speaks for. Um, that's not to say he's not doing things that aren't consequential for a broader populace, but that undeniably constitutes his core base. Um, and, and so let me just recognize this, that what left-wing populists will do is they will say things like the outgroup, the people who constitute a threat to, um, you know, uh, you know uh, true Americans would be different. It wouldn't be about foreigners or black and brown people. It would be about, you know, the, the plutocrats or the you know, Wall Street um, rich people. Right? And that what we need to do is recover American for working class Americans. That's the kind of flavor of left-wing populism. Um, uh, but to the extent that they are populists, their rhetoric again is in the service of sowing anger, disaffection, and it does not lead to constructive action. It doesn't lead to actual problem solving. 
And that's what that's another sort of feature of populism that makes it so problematic. Professor Howe, one of the things that um, I struggle with uh, is the fact that um, technology has advanced so fast and, um, you know, whether it's Twitter or Facebook um, and, you know, communicating disinformation or uh, the cable news networks, uh, Fox News and CNN, which seem to be on either side of the spectrum, um, and that they uh, actually are, are embedding populism in our culture even more rapidly. Um, do we have any solution for technology and, and the networks so that we can have a more balanced discourse? Um, I believe the technology uh, outlets and the cable news outlets are what's causing a lot of this um, just challenges within our discourse. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question in that to the extent that the technologies allow us to huddle up with our own tribe, and don't force us to speak across difference, that's problematic. Um, just as, and I think this is another feature of a changing media landscape, just as it becomes increasingly difficult to fact check and to hold claims um, uh, responsible um, and to account, uh, that becomes more and more difficult. Um, it's problematic for sure. Um, there, it's a mixed bag, though, because with the expansion of social media, you also see um, the introduction of new voices um, that people who previously may not have tuned into ABC, CBS, or NBC in 1968 to listen to an anchor who offer, you know, spoke with the voice of God to all Americans when they came home at the end of a work day, right? And, and we all stood in a common public square that, in fact, we weren't all standing in that square. And in fact, there were lots of people who were excluded and there were lots of views that were not represented and that social media can offer uh, a, a space for people to engage in ways that they hadn't previously. To my mind, technology at once presents opportunities and real challenges. You can see how a populist will leverage this technology in order to advance um, his own uh, objectives. There's a reason why um, Trump speaks primarily to Fox News and Twitter, right? He's got a channel that is um, stands steadfastly with him. So he, he's going to he's going to devote nearly all of his attention to that channel, just as he's going to speak out directly to the American people through tweets. Um, and that serves his political interests well. But I think you, what we also have seen over the last four years is you know, the New York Times and the Washington Post, right, their readership has expanded dramatically. And you see um, new uh, social media platforms that offer kind of robust discussion and organization um, coming to life as well. It's a mixed bag. One of our um, audience members uh, asked an interesting question uh, and says you may disagree, but uh, suggested that there are proposals to enlarge the size of Congress uh, and that Congress had been expanded every 10 years up until 1920, um, which would make the district smaller and alter the electoral college. Is that something that you would advocate for? And just as a, as a tag along on that, you know, there's a lot of talk about packing the Supreme Court now uh, uh, that Trump uh, uh, has passed through three of his Supreme Court nominees. What, what are your thoughts on expanding Congress and expanding the Supreme Court? Yeah, the argument for expanding Congress, what it has in mind, typically, I mean, the people who advance this argument, what they have in mind are concerns about representation. And what they say is that, you know, whereas at our nation's founding, each individual legislator represented tens of thousands of people, they now represent upwards of 750,000 people within the House. And that that creates a kind of distance between um, the elected officials and their constituents that, that degrades or that introduces all kinds of noise into the uh, first branch of government that's meant to be the voice of the people. 
So what we need to do is expand Congress so that legislators have closer relationships with their constituents. So I get that argument. Um, I, the, the, the concern that we lay out in this book has less to do with concerns about representation and more to do with concerns about effective government, the ability of our institutions to actually solve problems, to actually meaningfully attend to um, the challenges of modernity. And to uh, our minds, to, certainly to my mind, uh, going from 535 voting members of Congress to 735 voting members is not going to make Congress better capable of attending to something like climate change, something like structural inequality between the rich and the poor. Not only will the kind of collective action problems in any collective decision-making body be exacerbated, but the parochialism, the attention to local interests, to the exclusion of national interests will only be enhanced. Right? What you get in terms of bringing legislators closer to the people then is then greater attention to how will this comprehensive healthcare policy affect the organized interests back home. That parochialism is somewhat diluted in the Senate relative to the House precisely because the Senate represents states whereas the House represents districts. If what we do is shrink the size of the districts um, and let them proliferate, we're just going to exacerbate this problem of parochialism and special the special interest politics that flow from it within Congress um, and make Congress even sort of less capable of responsibly, systematically, comprehensively attending to the national challenges that we face. So I wouldn't get behind it. And um, so on the last program, we had uh, Professor Mearsheimer from University of Chicago who argued that um, the US would not allow China to achieve regional hegemony in Asia um, and that the battle would escalate into a war between the two countries. Um, one of the things I've been thinking about, you know, in, in, in kind of using and working with Professor Mearsheimer's argument that, you know, if the US wants to prevent China from establishing regional hegemony in Asia, Asia it needs to um, weaken China from an economic standpoint. Um, looking at it from the other point of view, is, is democracy really America's Achilles heel? In other words, if China wants to prevent the US from establishing hegemony in Asia, does it just need to weaken democracy? And is that effectively what Russia has been doing in our country? So there's so much in play here, and I don't want to offer two kind of too reductionist an argument here. But I will say that to the extent that, th that the threat to democracy, that populism constitutes a threat to democracy, right? Um, that what's at stake is not just, will we have a free and independent press, right? Will the voice of the people be heard? Will we have elections that are fair, wherein everybody can cast votes and we can count on them being counted? That's, that's the sort of stuff of measuring the health of a democracy. That, and that, that populism represents a very real threat too. But remember what I said about populism, which is that populism also doesn't set to work on solving problems. It's not, it's not about attending to immigration uh, reform in a systematic way or attending to kind of um, international challenges in a coherent, structured way. It's about maintaining this posture of opposition in the service of sowing anger and disaffection and outrage, which is the basis for the populist claim to power. As long as the base is riled up and angry, um, the populace is able to hold on to power. And so in that sense, you see this connection between the rollback of democracy through populism and the corruption of a country's ability to solve its own problems and, and advance its interests abroad. And so in that sense, I'd say, yes, there is a logic to those who would want to undermine, I mean, Putin's interest in rolling back democracy isn't just because he's concerned that, well, you know, where democracy flourishes, that will put pressure on his own country to become more democratic. It's that 
by pushing back against American democracy and fanning the flames of anger and disaffection and allowing populism to flourish, you, 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 you corrupt, you undermine the ability of the United States in this instance to actually advance, its, to solve its problems and advance its interests interest abroad. Is that, what do you think? What do you think? Is that- That's a great answer. Does that resonate? <laughs> That's a great answer. I, I do think that it, it, it is somewhat of our Achilles heel. And, um, you know, that kind of that leads to my next question, which it, you referred to in your opening remarks, um, this whole idea that you mentioned in your book of democracy has the seeds to sow its own destruction. I just that that uh, quote from the book really resonated with me. So I have to ask the question, um, do you expect democracy as we know it to fail in the end? Um, I think that, that democracy is and always will be vulnerable and that unless we set to work on not just ensuring that a broader range of voices are heard, but set to work on rebuilding our institutions in the service of problem solving, we are at risk of losing our democracy that we need institutions that can solve problems. And when we don't have them, we need to then set to work on reconstituting them. There have been, as I, as I indicated, there have been moments in American political history in which we've done that work, but, there, but in the main, when you think about institutional change, the history of institutional change, it's one of long periods of stasis in which we do close to nothing. And then there are these moments of crises in which we lurch in one direction or another and say, oh, okay, in the name of solving this scandal, this catastrophe, we now are going to rein in presidential power in this way, or we're going to rebuild the appropriations process in that way. And a much healthier politics is one in which we keep this space open and we continue to deliberate and we allow for learning and experimentation in the service of institutional change. That's what a healthy democracy would look like. Um, because it may well be, I mean, we offer in our book a whole host of recommendations um, about what we need to do. I am sure that even if all those recommendations are right for now, they won't be right for 40 years from now. Um, and I'm also sure that they're not all right for now. I don't know which ones are wrong, right? I mean, this is our best guess about what we need to do. Um, but we need a space where then we can deliberate over these things, try them out, and then adjust. Um, democracies that fail to do that will be democracies that fail. Great, I, I don't wanna gloss over the fact that when I made the introduction um, uh, uh, this, this, this evening, I talked about your new Center for Effective Government. And my last question is, um, I, I know that's a new center, and you're getting it off the ground, but do you intend for the center to be addressing some of these issues? And do you have a mission today? I just thought you might want to end on talking about the center a bit. I, I appreciate the question. It, this is exactly what the center is intends to do. Um, the Center for Effective Government, its goal is to think about institutional re reforms that will at once enhance the capacity of our governments, and there are many governments that constitute American politics, uh, to solve problems um, and to thereby enhance our democracy. Um, and we're doing that through a host of ways. Uh, we do that through education. Um, we run a leadership training program here in Chicago, or in where we bring together civic leaders from the public and um, nonprofit sectors, the government and nonprofit sectors, for six months to reflect upon challenges of leaderships and how they can reconstitute their institutions, their environments in the service of attending to the problems that Chicago faces. We hold uh, conferences wherein we bring together Democrats and Republicans to think about reforms that are needed in um, all kinds of spaces, be they relationships between the president and Congress, be they the administrative state, be they elections. Um, we, uh, we, bring, we bring together practitioners uh, to the University of Chicago to speak to people who are going to, uh, to academics who care about institutional reform. Um, we've done, entered into partnerships with the Washington Post this past fall to publish a whole bunch of articles that are thinking about 
fixes to our government, what they might actually look like. I mean, you asked earlier, Mark, um, you know, how do we set to work? How do we actually attend to the challenges that we face? One thing that I think we can do is leverage the kinds of assets that the University of Chicago has to offer, which is a whole bunch of expertise um, with subject area knowledge and a whole uh, and a big stage upon which to stand, which allows us to convene and to project uh, ideas and voices into the broader politics in the service of advancing meaningful change. That's what this center is trying to do. It's a brand new center. Um, uh, we started just a year ago. Um, so we're new and scrappy and we're just getting going. Um, uh, but we're undertaking a whole lot of activities in the service of amplifying um, uh, these kinds of concerns into our broader politics uh, and hopefully getting the next administration to pay attention to them at the national level, just as we're in very close conversations with all kinds of organizations here in Chicago, trying to meet the profound challenges that our city faces. Great, thank you for elaborating on that. And we're um, about uh, there on time tonight and I know you're so busy. I did wanna mention though, just briefly that uh, we'll be seeing more of you in Asia. I know you have some spots, you've already had a spot on CNBC Asia. Um, you'll be on Bloomberg and CNBC Asia as we approach and as we pass the election, hopefully we pass the election by then. So I'm really excited that you, know, you were part of this uh, process of uh, developing this series for us. Um, I want to thank you on behalf of myself and on the entire UN campus team. Um, I also would like to thank the UN campus team for developing and delivering this program to our growing global audience. So once again, thank you so much, uh, Professor Hall, and I look forward to seeing you again in the future. And for our audience, um, thank you again for logging into this and uh, our other programs in the US presidential election series. Good night and please stay safe.